Hi everyone, I'm Paola. And I'm Maddie. And we make up a research team based out of Wofford College in Spartanburg, South Carolina. To tell you all a little bit about ourselves, I'm originally from a small town in Mississippi. I am currently a rising senior Spanish and government major here as a part of Wofford's class of 2021. And just to throw in something fun about me, in my free time, I love listening to music on Spotify and hanging out outside. And I, Paola, am from Charlotte, North Carolina. I am a rising sophomore and a majoring in sociology, anthropology, and Spanish as part of Wofford's class of 2023. And in my free time, I love singing, songwriting, and thrift shopping. So this summer, we're working on a data inclusion project, focusing a lot of attention on health, wealth, and education inequities. A big part of our research has been going through information and research conducted in past summers and pulling out salient and powerful data points. So in this podcast, we want to share with you some of the important points that we've taken from Spartanburg's Racial Equity Index. In making this podcast and sharing what we've learned, we hope to promote awareness of the depth of the differences between demographics of people here in Spartanburg and to provide a resource for you all to understand equity and inequity in your community at large. To give you a little more information about exactly what the Racial Equity Index is, this report was created to reflect and analyze the condition of racial equity within Spartanburg, South Carolina. It discusses topics like inequities in housing, health, wealth, employment, and education, just to name a few. We don't have enough time in this podcast to hit every topic mentioned in the report, but we promise we are going to try to cover as many as we can. Awesome. Thank you, Paola. So I guess to get the ball rolling, I want to first start by diving into the topic of wealth distribution and poverty. And I know that this is a bit of a heavy topic, but I promise I'll try and keep it as light as possible for you all. On a national level, there exists a disproportionate wealth gap in the United States in which white families have 10 times the wealth of black families. The REI reflects that the condition of wealth in Spartanburg is also a microcosmic glimpse of what exists nationally. Here, white families tend to do better economically than black and Hispanic families, with 31% of Hispanic individuals in Spartanburg living below the federal poverty line and only 12.7% of white individuals living below it. When I read this statistic, it really hit me hard. Poverty, by its most simple definition, is a lack of possessions or money. But the reality is that it is so much more complicated than that. I know now that poverty is truly multifaceted, that it affects the ability of an individual to access resources and is often intrinsically intertwined with the existence of inequities in other areas. The reality of poverty is that individuals living in poverty are more likely to experience gaps in housing, health, unemployment, and education as well. Understanding the implications of this statistic has been so important for me because it's given me an opportunity to acknowledge my own privilege as a white female and to explore the deeper questions of why certain communities here in Spartanburg and around the country are struggling with poverty while others are not and how we can begin to think of solutions. I think that's great, Maddie. I definitely believe that the REI is an incredible tool to help us understand our community from multiple angles and to shed light on things that we may not see or experience in the Wofford bubble. I know that I've learned so much from this reading, and one big thing I want to share with you all listening is what I took away from the section on health. Statistics show that the Latinx community here has struggled with high rates of overweight and obesity, and I wanted to really dive in and understand what might be contributing to that. What I've taken away is that Latinx communities in Spartanburg have limited access to safe places to play and exercise, to nutritious foods, and to preventative health care, and these things can seriously affect an individual's health. I mean, think about it. Living in a community without access to gymnasiums or safe playgrounds, even pavement and sidewalks, probably doesn't encourage or incentivize children and adults to spend time outdoors. Families without easy access to public or private modes of transportation, working long hours, and struggling financially are probably going to choose fast food or non-nutritious and accessible food options. And families in fear of being reported for not having documentation or without the financial means to afford health insurance are likely going to forego preventative health care, waiting for things to become serious before seeking treatment. Now, I would like to share my own personal experience growing up 
regarding health and being a Latinx. Many first-gen Latinx students can probably relate to this, but I grew up being ashamed of my cultural and nutritious foods due to my peers making fun of what I ate. This is part of a larger problem, though, in how public school systems only categorize Americanized and Eurocentric foods as nutritious. But when I was little, I was always healthy. I was in the proper body mass index, and I had no health issues. However, when I started school, things changed a little for me. My mom or grandma would pack me refried bean and cheese sandwiches, which is a food with a healthy source of fiber. They would pack me rice and beans, pupusas de loroco y queso, baleadas, and more. Well, one day when I bit into my bean and cheese sandwich, this kid, and I still remember his name, it was Julian, by the way, he asked me in disgust, is that chocolate? I told him that it was refried beans and cheese, and he replied saying that it was gross, and all the other kids around me agreed. I shamefully put my sandwich back in my lunchbox, and after that I always dreaded lunch. I was afraid of getting made fun of for the different foods I ate. I begged my mom to pack me Lunchables or turkey sandwiches instead, but eventually she let me eat school cafeteria lunch instead. I always chose the more Americanized lunch options like chicken tenders or cheese sticks. Although the school lunch did not taste nearly as good as my grandma's food, my shame for my culture overpowered my love for Honduran and Salvadoran food. I gradually gained weight because of my change in diet and because of my desperate need to fit in with American culture. Looking back, I can completely understand where you're coming from, Paola. I know that when I was in elementary school, I was always the kid who packed a Lunchable and a Slim Jim or something totally unhealthy, a Twinkie even. <laughs> I know that based off of my diet and what I knew about the world and other cultures, I definitely might have been the person to look at your sandwich and say, no way, that's not for me. And it really is crazy to think about how American diet culture plays into health. And that just goes to show that understanding these topics, in this case, what it means to be healthy, isn't always as black and white as you might think. So now that I'm done thinking out loud, I think it's time that we hit our last topic of discussion, and that topic is education. Education is a topic more important now than ever before because of its growing value as a kind of currency within American society. We live in a knowledge-driven economy, claiming nearly 80 million students enrolled in elementary through higher ed. Education is the new norm, and for many, it's a tool necessary for success down the line. Unfortunately, equitable educational attainment is harder said than done, and statistics show that the educational attainment rates are categorically low and dropout rates are high for communities of color here in Spartanburg. However, we don't want to let that be the end of our conversation. Community partners and organizations within Spartanburg have been working diligently to understand where educational inequities lie and the ways in which are best to address them. The Spartanburg Academic Movement provides an awesome example of this kind of work. SAM has worked to provide early childhood education and development data, which can be used to both influence policy and program development decisions and help to make South Carolina's education system more equitable. And if you want to take a closer look at more of SAM's equitable education initiatives, be sure to check out their website, learnwithsam.org. They really are an amazing asset to our community. It's relieving to know that there are people and organizations out there who are really seeking to address some of our community's biggest issues and to promote change. And the beautiful thing is that growth and change come in so many different forms. You don't necessarily have to work for SAM to promote growth in your community. You can do something as simple as listening to this podcast and applying what you've learned to your experiences and interactions within and without the Wofford community. So on that note, I think it's time that we let you guys go, but I really hope that you were able to take something new and positive from this podcast. We hope you stay safe and healthy and stay tuned for what's next.